Welcome to Headlines You May Have Missed, Wednesday, January 3rd, 2018. In this edition of Headlines You May Have Missed, we'll talk about Bitcoin forks, Bitcoin regs, Bannon bashes Don Jr., Afghanistan turns deadly, tax bill writers, business motivations, lawfare from the states, and more on today's edition of Headlines You May Have Missed. We're going to get to our, our top story today, which is about the upcoming Bitcoin fork. And this is from Influenceville.com. The upcoming hard fork for Bitcoin has not received the, near the coverage of the past three hard forks of Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Gold, and the canceled Segwit2x fork. There are reasons for this. Firstly, they haven't had the same effect among the community. Drama. Just look at Bitcoin's community split between Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. It's ridiculous. <laughs> or not. This is This is obviously an editorialized version of this news item uh but uh the writer goes on to say and secondly nowhere near the proponents like roger ver and juan yihan Wu behind bitcoin cash big big influencers in the bitcoin and greater crypto community they along with bcash fans view bcash as the real vision of satoshi Nakaboto, one thing anyone must note is treating forks of Bitcoin like altcoins. Really? Uh, despite the recent FUD, fear, uncertainty, doubt around Bcash and Bitcoin, you must understand, you must, they say, you must understand there is only one Bitcoin. Uh, this doesn't mean a fork like Bcash or BTG won't be successful. If you go to... Uh, is headlines.com you'll see the latest i had our headlines that you may have missed report and you'll find the link and i'll just highlight it here in this report here you see it there bitcoin private and it's got some information like how can you get your bitcoin private after the fork and and other uh, vital informations there we're going to go to our next story here which is ecb governor calls for tax regulation on bitcoin i guess this th shouldn't be too too much of a surprise this is from guardian.ng uh top european central bank official on wednesday called for governments to regulate and tax bitcoin labeling the cryptocurrency an object of speculation and a tool for money laundering uh, here you go. You're using that that fear to to get the rest of you know the rank and file folks to say yes, yes, yes. Please regulate this. Oh no, money laundering. <gasps> they might be dealing in drugs. They might be. They might be negotiating to buy products and services from one another that we don't want them to buy. Okay. One ought to apply what the basic rule in any other financial transaction. Everyone involved should reveal their identity. And that's the key, man. That is the key. That's the real worry here. Anonymity. Any, anything approaching anonymity is the great fear of government. Because if government doesn't know who's buying what from what, well, then how are they going to get their revenues from them? How are they going to collect their uh, taxes? We need a value. And there you go. We need a value-added tax on Bitcoin since it's not a currency, says Nowotny, who was head of Austria's central bank. Central bank. Nowotny's comments echo those by other ECB officials who regard the Bitcoin's spectacular surge in value as a bubble rather than a sign. It could be a digital competitor to the euro's single currency used by its 19 member nations. Now, I will say, I don't know if Bitcoin's going to be it or if it's going to be multiple digital currencies, but digital cryptocurrencies are most assuredly competing with your fiat currencies. Whether it ends up, you know, whether Bitcoin lives, dies, or whatever happens, cryptocurrencies are here to stay. And the further that you push 
to try to regulate and control cryptocurrencies, the more you're going to find people going underground. And you know what? That's that's actually not a bad thing for me. I'm I'm totally fine with that result. We'll go to our next story. Well, let's let's highlight it here. Remember, remember, if you haven't, go to isheadlines.com and you can link to all of the stories that we're going to cover here as well as more stories because we're not going to get to all the stories. We only do the basically what we do is we have the headlines and we go, we got 20 minutes. Let's see how many headlines we cover. This next one is, wow, it's really interesting. For me, I'm, I'm not following things too closely as far as the the inner workings of uh, Trump-Sylvania, but apparently there's more trouble within Trump-Sylvania than I imagine. So this, here it is. No, no, that's old. Let me let me click out of the old articles and go to Trump-Sylvania here. This is from international business time oh no 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 where is it where is the trump story you know what i may have accidentally clicked off to get trump story but you know what that's okay guess what i can do i can reopen it here there you see here you see steve bannon and this is from 4x live so let me let me highlight the key part here this is this is what, what Steve Bannon said, and he, remember, he is the former campaign manager for Donald Trump, and he has, uh, he has his comment, he's doing the, the interview circuit to, po to uh, promote his upcoming book, I guess, called Fire and Fury Inside the Trump, Trump White House. So this is what he said. The three senior guys in the campaign thought it was good a, a good idea to meet with a foreign government inside Trump Tower in the conference room on the 25th floor with no lawyers. They didn't have any lawyers. And the, the three key guys that he's talking about are Paul Manafort, Jared Kushner, which is Trump's son-in-law, and, of course, Trump's son himself, Don Jr. Paul Manafort's already been been caught up in the snare. And he says, even if you thought this was not treasonous or unpatriotic or bad s, there you can you can see the word there for yourself because I'm trying to do a clean show, folks. Okay, I'm trying to be decent. I'm trying to be a decent human being, and I happen to think that it's all of that. You should have called the FBI immediately. So in the book, Bannon, pre, th this is I uh, the four X live writing. Uh, in the book, Bannon predicted Kushner and Don Jr. will be rung up on money, money laundering charges. It goes through Deutsche Bank and all the Kushner S. The Kushner S is greasy. They're going to go right through that. They're going to roll these two guys up and say, play me or trade me, he said. So that's... That's pretty. That's a pretty interesting development there. I don't think that Steve Bannon is targeting Donald Trump. By the way, he's not. He's targeting what he perceives, rightly or wrongly, to be a bad element in the Trump camp, which is definitely. I didn't. I. I, I didn't realize where Don Jr. was in this camp, but if Don Jr. is in the Kushner Ivanka camp, okay. And that, that Kushner, Ivanka, Ivanka is his wife and also Don Stoner, uh, that they're, they're kind of perceived to be the, the neocons within the, 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 the Trump camp. They're the ones that have been steering things away from, from the Bannon camp, which is a little bit more radical and I would say a little bit more isolationist, like a lot of the foreign policy that you're now seeing from Donald Trump. That's that's not what Bannon wanted. That's not what a lot of the folks in the Bannon camp wanted. They didn't they didn't they didn't want to expand the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan and and they weren't looking to get heavily involved in Syria. So so you got this uh, little internecine war still going on within Trump camp. That's uh Quite an intriguing development. Let's go to. Or we're still. Let's see where we're at here. We're at the. Oh, we're at eight minutes, so we got time to keep on going here. 
The U.S. military already suffered a combat loss in Afghanistan this year, and it could be a sign that 2018 will be deadly. All right, let's, let's go to that. Click on that, because I think I... I That's another one that I was trying to close out of some stories that I had already covered, but I had inadvertently... Uh, closed out a couple of articles that I actually hadn't gotten to yet. So this is, let me highlight the key part here. So this is from businessinsider.com. Details are scant on the engagement that killed the service member who remains ident unidentified pending notification of his family. A press release from the U.S. Forces Afghanistan said the attack occurred in Aiken, a uh, Pashtun district identified by some local observers as a, quote, headquarters, unquote, for ISIS activity in the country. We are deeply saddened by the loss of one of our own, General John Nicholson, the commander. Well, okay. It, of course, he's going to say that. Saddened, but not surprised. The article goes on. As ISIS was routed out of its strongholds in Syria and Iraq last year, the crippled organization has shifted back to a franchising and insurgency strategy, a strategy, one that's made its ragtag Afghan offshoot, ISIS Khorasan, a serious player in Nagara and a serious threat to the U.S. forces hunting its fighters there. Renewed U.S. engagement in Nangar. Nangarhar literally began with a bang in 2017. Last April, defense planners made global headlines with their first real-world strike using the, quote, mother of all bombs, unquote. The massive ordnance air blast, a.k.a. <coughs> the mother of all bombs, one of the largest conventional music munitions in the U.S. arsenal. The target, a network of ISIS fighter tunnels in Nangarhar, Aiken district. So, so the, the, the prediction here is that because of ISIS being pushed out of Iraq and Syria or Iraq and Syria, that they're going to be more active, especially in regions where the U S is in cur current, currently engaged. So this could heighten the casualty rates in Afghanistan. And if you're, you're looking at Afghanistan, it, it seems to be, once again, slowly ratcheting up. So if you thought that electing Donald Trump was going to decrease the wars, and this kind of ties back to the last story, uh, who's winning within, within, within Trumpotopia? And it appears that the, at least on the, it seems to be on the domestic front that, that the, the original Donald message is kind of holding more true. He is getting rid of a lot of regulations. I'm not sure if he's targeting the regulations in the order that maybe necessarily I would target them, but that that probably deserves a, a whole other show in and of itself. But But certainly he's getting rid of regulations, and certainly he is aggressively doing what he said regarding immigration. He hasn't built the wall, but he's kind of building a virtual wall within. Uh, so domestically seems to be on point as far as what his promises are. Not on point as far as maybe what I would want to see happen, but domestic, or foreign policy-wise, yeah, he's, I would say, increasingly... He's a little different from Obama. It, you know, maybe in key areas, there's a definite shift much more towards Israel than there was under Obama. But in a lot of other key ways, you know, his policy regarding Afghanistan, <coughs> pardon me, his policy regarding Afghanistan, <laughs> I, 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 th I think he's following the Obama plan. His policy regarding uh, preemptive striking and uh, spreading freedom through war. Yeah, I say he's continuing what Obama continued from Bush, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
Go to our next story here. <coughs> if I can get to it, suddenly I made the mistake of uh, going downstairs to do this show without a drink by my side. And that was stupid. So congressman took job with business group <coughs> while writing tax bill that benefits its members. Well, I know. I know. I'm surprised. I, I can't believe that. This is from IB Times. Ohio Rep. Pat Tiberi accepted an offer to run a state-run state trade organization, the Ohio Business Roundtable, while helping write the Republican tax bill. The trade group's member companies have donated to Tiberi's political campaigns, and many of them stand to gain from the bill, which slashed business income taxes and introduced several provisions that will benefit wealthy investors and corporate executives in various industries. He will begin the job by January 35th for 31st. So he, he's part of writing a tax bill that will benefit people who will be employing him a month or so after he wrote the tax bill. Nothing to see here, folks. International Business Times has identified 17 companies that are both members of BRT and donator, donator, donors to Tiberi's 2018 campaign committee. Ah, so they've also donated to the campaign committee. That's cool. Some of these businesses, including Marathon Petroleum, have lobbied Congress as recently as the fourth quarter of this year on tax issues that will directly benefit them. Executives from three of these companies, Marathon, Huntington, Bankshire, and Brands, are members of the BRT Executive Committee. Committee. Committee? Committee. I'm going to call it Committee. I like it. It sounds makes it sound more dystopian, the Committee. So, and that's good because it's kind of a dystopian theme going on with this story here. The BRT chairman, who was the CEO of Marathon Petroleum, discussed the specifics of the job with Tiberi, during this time. And what a surprise. <clears throat> Tiberius' office denies that the congressman's role in writing the tax bill was influenced by his em future employment. Notice that they're not denying that what was written in the tax bill benefited his future employers, if you will. They're saying, oh, no, 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 that wasn't influence. I mean, if it benefited them, they Purely coincidental. This is one of the reasons why I refer to uh, the state in general. The this the state. If you, you, you if if you think about the state, the state in the modern sense of the term, it's simply a method of of human governance, and it operates under an assumption that coercion is an appropriate management tool, even when you're dealing with activities by individuals that do not directly harm other individuals. And so I refer to the state, the modern state, uh, as it's, it's a coercive enterprise. It's a, it's a business, except it's a business that has coercion as one of its marketing tools, if you will. So this guy, I'm not, you know, I, you know, innocent until pr presumed, or it, presumed innocent until proven guilty, although he's he's not denying the the essentials here. So this guy is, you know, he's he's using the power of the state to position his future and employment in a way that's going to help him make more money. That's kind of what they do. If you look at what Congress members enjoy when. When they're in office, and then, of course, when they're out of office, you know, they get pension for life, they get free health care for life, and they go in with a certain economic level, and then they come out with a certain economic level that suddenly is significantly higher. Sometimes they go from tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands. Sometimes they go from hundreds of thousands to millions. Sometimes they go from millions to tens of millions or hundreds of millions. And then, of course, they're in a position to be able to garner huge, huge fees as far as lobbying and or, quote-unquote, speaking is concerned. And a lot of times 
the speaking deals where they get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to give a speech depending on the amount of power that they have. It, it, that's, that's, that's really just uh, an indirect way to pay them to lobby. Clintons, looking at you, looking at you. These, the, the, the Clintons are, are some, of the, some of the best coercive enterprise entrepreneurs in the business. Absolutely. Good little commie, uh, uh, coercive enterprise entrepreneurs. It's good to see. Now, this next story, we're, I think this is going to be our last story. We've got two minutes left here. So I'm going to get to this real quick, and then we're going to end this. Delaware to sue Environmental Protection Agency for failure to curb out-of-state air pollution. Now, I, I picked this story. This is an interesting story as far as the... The strategy that, that's going on between the the various camps who are trying to position themselves in a way to more more fully benefit from the windfall that is the course of enterprise. This is from the Dover Post. Delaware recently announced its intent to send four notice of intent to sue letters to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency regarding air pollution that comes into Delaware from other states. The NOIA letters are required by the... Okay, who cares about that? So Delaware has previously petitioned for relief to the EPA. The Clean Air Act entitles Delaware to relief from upwind pollution, and the remedy we are seeking is reasonable and within the EPA's authority and responsibility to grant, said Governor John Carney. Delawareans deserve clean air, but our air quality is significantly impacted by pollution traveling downwind from other states. We are simply asking that the EPA require these power plants that pollute Delaware's air to run their existing pollution control equipment when the plants are in operation. So it's kind of a lawfare thing. It's This isn't necessarily new, but what's interesting to me about this particular uh, lawsuit is they're, they're not suing the federal government because of a, a law or a regulation that's directly affecting them. They're suing the federal government because of regulations that they argue indirectly threaten them that that could open up a whole can of worms as far as states well really it's 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 not states suing i it's whoever happens to have the reins whether it's uh in this case it's it's what's this dude's name here uh governor john carney administration which is really this dude and his buddies and his political allies and his business allies and who benefits and who doesn't benefit in this case uh, his his inner circle group are benefiting and so they're they're looking to use government in a way that helps them benefit in one way shape or form so i guess we'll see more of this and um, that should be quite interesting and I think that's where we're going to end this here. It's, oh, oh, we went two minutes over. Dude, I don't want to do that. So this is over. So thank you. Thank you very much for watching headlines that you may have missed. And, oh, I'm going to click out of this uh, website there. There you go. So thank you for watching headlines that you may have missed. I will be downloading this. I'll put it on YouTube. And I'm going to try to do these every Monday through Friday at 12.30 p.m. I want to get done in time to watch over on the Sovereignty Network. You want to go over to this. I think if you just... Uh, do a Facebook search for the Sovereignty Network. You'll find the page. Because at 1 o'clock, Crypto Corner is on. And this is news about cryptocurrencies. I try to listen to that show uh, every day. So be sure, after you've uh, taken in all the glory and the wonder that is headlines that you may have missed, that you go over to the Sovereignty Network Facebook page and you tune in for Crypto Corner and also be sure that you go to isheadlines.com and that will take you to a listing of all the 
headlines that you may have missed. You'll see the, the most recent headlines that you may have missed will be right on top. You click on that, and you can actually go to all these stories that I talked about yourself. This is Paul Gordon of iState.tv. We'll see you tomorrow at 1230 Eastern Standard Time.